Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have Jasmine St. Clair. You may remember her as being one of the top adult stars. She has since transitioned to a mainstream career, which is very difficult, but she's managed it incredibly successfully. She's been a VJ. She's done mainstream acting. She was a pro wrestling diva. And now... She is a one woman show. Jasmine, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on here. I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Of course. So I always like to kind of start in the beginning with people, um, just to kind of get a sense of like how you entered into this like crazy world of ours initially, um, before we talk about how you got out. Uh, so how did you end up getting in the adult industry? Well, um, it was completely my idea, by the way, just so you know, I know most people, most of the time it's someone's like suitcase pimp, AKA boyfriend that like pushed them into these ideas, but it was totally my idea. And that's like another story in and of itself. Um, at the time I was working at a club in New York city that had features like feature dancers. This is the thing of the nineties, which is a really cool thing. And, uh, you know, I met some of them that were going through there. Uh, one in, uh, what was her name? Lori Wagner, who is a penthouse model and a few other girls. I remember and, her. Yeah. Really pretty. Uh, she was singing, by the way, she would sing during her act, but she could really sing. I was impressed. I'm like, wow, she's multi-talented. So I just sort of, you know, looked into that whole situation and how people actually made money doing that. And, uh, you know, the rest is sort of history <laughs> from there. So back then you could kind of do well just doing stills, you know, you could shoot just for like magazines and things like that. And that's often how a lot of girls started. Is that how you started or did you start doing uh, movies right away? Um, there were three choices I could do. Like remember back then they had like girls that had, 90 quadruple F breast implants, which were freak shows, or you could just do magazines, um, or just make up a bunch of credits, uh, or do porn, which I chose. And I became their biggest freak mm -hmm. show of the nineties, so, you know, what was just a lot cooler, I thought. Uh, but I never really, you know, saw myself as an adult film star. I saw myself more of a figure in that whole like 90s shot culture era. I didn't really know what I was doing mm. at that time, like what was going on, just being in that whole like Stern and Springer arena, but it was cool. <laughs> yeah, those were definitely different times. And I know that you were one of the most popular Howard Stern guests. Um, and, and back then that was like such a big deal to be on the Howard Stern show. I remember I wanted to be on the Howard Stern show so bad and I could never get it. He never wanted me on. And now I don't care. <laughs> but back then that was such a coveted thing. Were you even 18 to get on the show then, Holly? I, mean <laughs> I turned 18 in 1996. So, okay, so but even, could... even then late nineties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It been yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a total trip. It was, I don't think I'll ever have anything like that ever again. Like that era is something no. that could never, ever be recreated. Yeah. I mean, there was definitely like so much going on back then and, and the shock culture, like you, like you mentioned. Um, and I guess part of the, the shock culture back then was, you know, doing these, these big crazy sex acts. And I know that you, how you had, um, which is it the second world record for the biggest gangbang? Is that right? Yeah. Part two. And <laughs> how, how did that go? <laughs> um, interesting. I loved it though. Um, it was, I mean, it was just my way of, you know, there are just many things attached to that which obviously is a part of my show, my one woman show, because it's just, it put me on the map in some weird way. 
you know, it's sort of like one of those things where people remember you for something, but they don't always know what it is. But um, it was my idea. <laughs> That's what most people don't know. Um, I don't regret doing it. I think it's actually really funny. <laughs> it's just one of those things that you look back at and you have to really think about the logistics of it. Is that something that's possible? Honestly. And then you now look at this and, and there are all these girls like, well, I did 700. I did 800. It's like, oh, bitch, no, you didn't. <laughs> um, I think like the days of those things are just gone. You know, people could yeah. say they did it. It's it's just the whole beauty of being in that era and doing something so insane is it's before the internet. Yeah. I mean, it's funny that you brought up the logistics thing because um, I actually had Lisa Ann on my podcast. I've had her on a couple of times. And one of the things that we talked about was like the logistics of gangbang and like how hard it is to put together and all of the things that go into it. Because it's not just like, it's actually not just about, and I'm sure you'll agree with this. It's not just about like who you want to work with, right? Like who you like, but the guys have to get along with each other because they're around all these other guys and they can like set each other off. So it's almost more about like the relationships between the men than it is necessarily about like the relationships with the woman. Did you find that that was kind of similar experience for you? Well, yeah. I mean, you're sitting there or whatever is laying down and it's sort of the same, but don't kid yourself. It's equally as important because it's just one bitch line. Like, could you hurry the fuck up? And that you go like from this, like, yeah. and trust me, I mean, I did that yeah. quite a few times. I've said quite a few obnoxious things just to see what would happen. And for my own cheap thrills, I mean, why not? It's my day. Right. So, um, I didn't know any better. I wasn't, I just, like, I didn't really know what I was doing in a way, so to speak. I didn't know mm -hmm. what kind of like, culture I was creating, which I guess is, mm. It was fun at the time. <laughs> and yeah, uh, it was like a circus. How long did that take you to shoot? 10 hours, I want to say. I don't know, like nine or 10 hours. It's really, yeah. um, it's tough to remember, but because you're up so early in the morning, like driving there. And I never really lived mm -hmm. in that bubble of, uh, you know, being friends with people in that business and all of that. So I just had my own bubble I was in. I just like went there, I did my thing and went home and went to my, my own world, if that makes any mm -hmm. sense. And I think I'm yeah. still the same. No. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah. No, I, I hear you. I'm, I, I definitely have friends in the industry, but I also like keep my personal life pretty separate, you know, like it's a job yeah. and then you go home and then you're, you're, you know, you at home. Like um, nice. yeah, I just, and I'd imagine you probably took breaks too. Obviously. I think a lot of people, when they think of like a big number like that, cause it was like 300 people, is yeah. that right? That they think it's like all constant, you know, not understanding that like, of course one needs to take breaks, needs to drink water, go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. And it's cool. like all of those kinds of things. Fix your hair, fix your eyelashes. And the, right. You know, what's funny is is again, I'm always going back to the logistics because I think about that. And you know what, like, honestly comes to my mind. First thing is parking. Where are those people going to park? Where am I going to find a location that's big enough to hold a large group of men? What about, Kate? am I feeding them? What about Kate? What, oh my God, paperwork? Are you kidding me? Like how many model releases did you have to process? And then like, where is everyone going to park? These are the things like as a producer that run through my head when I'm thinking about putting something together that big, um, who can I ask like about who helped you produce it? And did you like sense that there was all this like insanity just around those logistics? That's why I was on the other end of things. I had like nothing. I just, I saw the paperwork, but just the other things, there were other people, uh, that was at a soundstage. So I had no idea. It was a big soundstage. Um, so they had, like three or four other people dealing with that. It looked like a shit show. 
Yeah. Make a surface. A really bad <laughs> surface. It actually, I'm lying. It looked like a freaking insane asylum. Uh, some of those people look like they just got out of jail. So trust me, I was hoping maybe there'd be a fight and I could just somehow like dwindle my way out of it. <laughs> um, no such luck. I feel like the most interesting thing about a situation like that is kind of um, like the behind the scenes. Like Um, did did, like people become friends there? Did like, you know, guys like, like find out that they both played basketball and then like got each other's numbers and went like played hoops afterwards. I don't know. Like just the whole, like the whole culture, like, you know, behind the scenes, I just find like, for me, that's so interesting. I think that like two of them were pizza delivery guys. Like I'm not joking. And they were down there from Sacramento. So they saved up enough of their pizza wages to come down there. (laughs) I don't know. I I really made it a point not to be too friendly with these people. I just don't want, I just had no desire to, because once you see them, it's like being in a really bad version of like the walk-in dad meets like (sighs) the apocalypse. (laughs) It's like the first part of it is being <laughs> some big glamorous con film festival. Um, what is it? Like a big, beautiful press conference. And then the rest of it, it's like being walked to your death and seeing this like a depressing <laughs> thing around you. It's like, huh, well, this is a whole other side of it I didn't think of. Um, you know, it just, I don't know. <laughs> I, I wasn't like, I don't, I don't really, oh, oh that's what happened. Once one, uh, this is, I'll tell you a funny story. I, um, I, what, last year when I did the shows pre pandemic, um, one of the guys actually showed up who was hot. Like, wow. the day. yeah, yeah. He looked cute then. What the hell happened? Like now I have no idea. <laughs> he put in a bunch of weight. I think he got married. Wow. <laughs> wow. Does his wife know? Um, maybe. Guess we don't know. Well, she'll find out. I'll make sure. (laughs) I mean, that is, I guess that's an experience. I mean, you know, obviously I think for you, it's an experience that you'll never forget, but that's definitely an experience that like none of those guys will ever forget, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Well, we had some people going out. Um, someone was complaining about me that I was real, that I wasn't nice. I'm like, I don't have to be nice. Like, fuck you. So. Oh my God. You're having sex with like 300 people. Of course you don't have to be nice. Right? Like it's something. your show and you're going through, you're putting your body through a lot. And I feel like you don't, this is not like customer service. <laughs> yeah. McDonald's. <laughs> um, no, it's just, yeah, exactly. Finally, see, people have to understand this shit. They just don't get it. Um, you know, then you, you, I don't really, like, I never really grew up watching um, movies that much. Like, I never did. I saw, like, one my entire life. Um, so the only film I saw, it had, like, uh, High Pachelet, Randy Spears, mm-hmm. and Peter North. And this is my mm-hmm. first experience ever watching a film. Uh, the end credits start rolling. And, and you'll probably think this is funny. So underneath the, the blonde guy's name, it says Peter North. And they switch up the names. And I didn't realize that till like much later on. I'm like, oh, these aren't exactly the brightest people that put together these credits. And um, just being, like being in that whole business and being like just in the whole editing room and just, seeing the people on the other side of things, you know, especially on that day and all different angles. It's like, I wonder what's going to be the big like screw up of the day. So Mm -hmm. there were these uh, tiki themed lamps that were acquired at the last minute by um, some assistant. He later on got into like a shootout with the LAPD at a home depot, like an office depot or something. So just like the same, just, shows you the type of people that were just involved. It's, it's like a circus. And the actual person yeah. that orchestrated the whole thing, um, he passed away in jail a few years ago, which is oh, really wow. sad. He was British. Um, I think it was like heart. I mean, people have, it's really weird. Like anyone I know who goes to jail in Colorado, 
they always pass away there. They die there. Actually, my manager at that time, he also died in Colorado at the same jail. Wow. Yeah. All right. Lesson learned. Don't get arrested in Colorado. <laughs> don't go to jail there. You don't want to go there. Yeah. So let's um, transition a little bit um, into your, what you did afterwards. So you had a very successful transition into mainstream, as we in the porn world like to say, the, the real world, I guess. Um, you were a pro wrestling diva. You were a uh, VJ. Um, you did some mainstream. You did a bunch of mainstream acting. How did that transition come about? And did you find that your porn persona helped you in that sense, or was it a hindrance in any way? <sighs> Let's see. It helped, and mm -hmm. with the wrestling especially, because um, I grew up watching that. It was a really lucky break. Uh, my last contract was with, uh, a gentleman named Rob Black, Extreme Associates, and right. he decided to start a oh, wrestling company. Oh, I know who he is. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so he started a wrestling company. And when I was in that mm -hmm. side of it, I was really happy. Um, then we just started having like falling outs and I just wasn't showing up to shoot films as much anymore. Then I met some wrestlers who in, were in ECW wrestling. Then I slowly but surely just kind of like moseyed on over that way. And I just stayed. Like I never, I said this before the podcast, I think I'm probably the only or one of the few ex-adult film stars that don't have an OnlyFans or anything like that. I reserve the domain. Mm -hmm. I, just, I don't really, you know, whatever. It's just there. Right. Um, it's and, always good to have your domain just in case. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but it just, it was easy for me. And like, when you do that, like I took actual wrestling classes, but because of my frame, I don't really wrestle a bunch of matches like here and there. Um, then yeah, I was doing that for quite some time. I still get called to do a lot of signings and stuff like that. Uh, then Rob, I'm still friends with Rob, despite like the tumultuous like breakup, I should say, or the ending of the work relationship. Yeah. But he's supposed to be restarting his federation. And I hope he does. Cause I always thought he was like too creative to be like doing some of the stuff he was doing. Right. Yeah. It was stuff was pretty intense. Yeah. yeah. Total fuckery. <laughs> Um, and you've done some mainstream acting roles. Um, I think you've done quite a bit of, of horror stuff. Is that right? No, no, no. I've done like maybe three things completely. The, um, most people would think that because most women who are an adult go into that because it's the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. Really, really easy. Mm -hmm. um, no, I had actually, I taken out my implants. You know, I went like two cups smaller. Um, I gone into a bunch of classes, you know, you take classes all the time, like whatever for dialects, um, I was at the Strasburg Institute in New York, Meisner, I went to second city to the conservatory to learn improv, not for comedy, but just cause it helps with acting, mm -hmm. UCB, like all those things. Um, and it just, you know, you, people will test you. They will see how far, you know, are you really going to stick this out? Are you going to go audition just like everyone else? Yeah. So, you know, that's really, you know, it's what it's, it's what it is. It's a fun thing. I've made a lot of good friends that way. And, um, you know, I produced a web series with one of my good friends from second city. Uh, and I kept going and that's it. You know, I would, I would have no desire whatsoever to do another adult film. Uh, that's not for mm -hmm. me. I have friends that do that. Uh, and that's fine. But it's just really freaking annoying when you have fans that are like, oh, you're going to do another film? No, dickweed, okay? Your mother. So what, what was your favorite mainstream film that you worked on? What do you think was like, I don't know, the, the best I one so far? everything. But the first thing I ever did was a National Lampoon movie, which was fun, Dorm Days 2. I just played another version of Jasmine. Um, mm-hmm. 
And then I just really liked when I just finished, it's actually in a bunch of film festivals. I would say it's similar enough to a mm-hmm. Lifetime movie. It's called The Twist in the Road. It's a very LA themed film. Um, it's about a woman who ends up losing all her money. It's her husband dies and doesn't leave her anything. It's a really fucked life for her. But I play one of her good friends mm-hmm. in the film. Then, um, Fantastic. The other one I liked was Daughters of Dolomite. It's a spinoff of Dolomite movies. So I ride motorcycles and I get to ride my motorcycle on that. It's my favorite part of it is riding a bike. It is. That's awesome. That's why I don't get it. It's like people ride bicycles. Like I went on, the only time I went, okay, I went on, I went on an internet, internet date twice in my life. Like once during the pandemic last year, oh my God, the guy took the bandana off his face. He had pimples. And his nose, like, what was up with that shit? Okay. I'm like, yeah, nice meeting you. Uh, then I told him, I'm going to Florida. This is too crazy for me. Nice meeting you. I just walked in. Then the other time, the guy said, yeah, I'll meet you on my bike. He had a freaking bicycle. Like, you don't go, po- you see me with a photo on my profile and a motorcycle. You tell me you own a bike. What do you think I think you own? A 10 speed? Wait, did he show up? So he showed up on like a, like a little two wheeler, like, was it like a beach cruiser with like a basket on the front? Like, did he put a picnic in there for you? No, if he did, I just, no, no, no. that wouldn't have changed anything. I, just, I don't get it. Like seriously, people, they automatically assume. Do you find that dating is, is hard for you? Um, Given your past, do people recognize you when you go on dates with them? Or has it been like enough time has passed that you feel like, you know, you, you're kind of out there as a real person and people aren't just seeing Jasmine St. Clair? It's a 50-50 toss-up. So I once went out with this guy and then I went to his parents' house to meet them. It's like a few years ago. His dad remembered me from Howard Stern. <laughs> and oh, yeah, well, of course, time. yeah, Howard Stern. Yeah, it was so funny. Um, some people like don't care. Some people do, you know, some people like just, uh, like, I don't think the best way to get to know someone is going to their show. I'll put it to you that way. Mm. Like to date someone for yeah. like a year or two years and then they come to your show and find it just, they'll know that, you know, you did this in the past, but they don't know to what it to free. But I don't think it's like anything mm-hmm. to be ashamed of. It's like, whatever, who gives a fuck? Right, right. Yeah, it's a part of your story. It makes you who you are. And yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that. It's interesting Dude. that you say that because actually when I first when I first met my husband, we met on uh, Tinder. So <laughs> when we first met my husband, uh, he didn't know I worked in the adult industry when before we went out because I would not put it in my profile because I didn't want guys to date me just because like I was a way for them to like, get into the industry or meet porn stars or something like that. So I would not tell people until later. And, um, I told him and it, what's funny is he's a private investigator. So this guy can find out anything. Right. And he actually told nobody, he told me he refused to look me up because he's like, I want to get to know you as how you represent yourself. I don't want to have like a biased report of you from like some weird internet source. Um, and back then, actually, no, not back then it's been a race since then, but I'm sure you remember Luke Ford, you know, that like we dated briefly and it was a terrible idea and he wrote about me a lot on his blog. Yeah, it was, look, it was right before I got sober. Okay. (laughs) It was not in the best place of my life. (laughs) I'm not exactly proud of it. We all have our dark moments in our life. (laughs) <laughs> but if you could find this, all the things that he wrote, you know, like sometimes at the, like you Google me because his website was so popular and all of his blog posts about me would come up. And so it was a little off putting for people, but yeah. So my husband just didn't, he refused to like Google me or look me up or learn anything about me from the internet because he wanted to get to know me as like an authentic person. And you know, five years later we're married and we have a kid. So I guess it worked. <laughs> Does someone like finally smash his knuckles? You know, I, I, he's become, 
the last I heard of him, he was spouting off some kind of pretty xenophobic content on some YouTube channel. Um, and you know, I mean, I haven't spoken to him in years, but, uh, you know, kind of really extreme weird shit. And, and that's the last I heard of him. One of those. I don't know what he's doing now. One of those. Yeah. Like my, like Lainey could tell you, I'm totally, I get it. Like I'm hooked on that whole Mike Lindell thing right now. I, I don't believe in all his views, but I just, I'm hooked on craziness. Sometimes I get mm-hmm. swooped into it somehow. Yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, what is humans were attracted to drama, um, to excitement and sometimes, uh, not in the most healthy ways. So, All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back and we are going to talk about Jasmine's one woman show, which you can actually go see. So hang tight. We'll be right back. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is like the biggest online sex toy retail store. And in fact, they don't just offer sex toys. They also have movies. They have lingerie. They basically have anything sexy that you could be looking for. Now they have an incredible offer. Get 50% off of any one item when you go to adamandeve.com, but that's not where it ends. So not only will you get 50% off any one item, they will also load up 10 free gifts for you on top of that. You will get six free movies, a free mystery pack that includes an item for him and a special toy for her and something we know you'll both enjoy, plus free shipping. Now that's a lot of free stuff, but you can only get this offer if you go to adamandeve.com and use my code HOLLY. That's adameve.com, use code HOLLY for 50% off of any one item plus 10 free gifts. All right, guys, so we are back. So Jasmine, one of the questions that I've been asking a lot of my guests these days, because I feel it's pretty relevant in this crazy world, is how are you taking care of your mental health these days? A few ways. Um, I don't watch the news. I don't follow everything. I just don't stay glued to the TV set and get crazy. Um, I certainly, um, buying vintage collections of jewelries and launching a little thing on eBay and just, you know, finding other things to keep myself occupied. Uh, talking to friends and just staying away from hysterical people. I just feel that's a great way to bring down your health. When you get hysterical, it brings stress. Uh, a good friend of mine had, um, he was in stage four cancer. And his good friend was making him more hysterical and she was hysterical. And I just couldn't deal with them. I just like, I'm like, all right, whatever. So it's a year that's gone by. Everything's fine. He doesn't even have it. I'm like, I told you. I said it was serious in the beginning, but if you don't want people to fly three, 4,000 miles out to deal with this with you is too much. You know, some of us were dealing with other things on our own. I said, she was working them up. And yeah, there are things that are serious, but I just, I, I don't deal with historical things very well and historical people. I just don't. And, um, you know, I like to investigate things thoroughly. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves, and this is something that I've definitely come to learn and really hold on to as I get older, is to really keep like recognize who you're surrounding yourself with. Because yeah, like you said, the people that you have around you, the people in your environment are really a direct effect on your mental health. And, you know, I found as I've gotten older it's been so much better for me to just cut negative people out of my life, people who are not serving me, people who are bringing me down. Um, And, you know, culling the herd of friends, so to speak, to the people who really like bring me joy and, and happiness because like, why do we, you know, before I felt all of these duties to remain friends with people just because we had known each other for so long. But then after a time you find like, why am I wasting, you know, it's like you're this emotional vampire who's just like sucking the lifeblood out of me. And life is, is too short for that. And, you know, you don't owe 
really anybody their own happiness. And if people are unwilling to make changes to change their lives, it's like, you know, there's only so many times you can tell somebody the same thing over and over again. And, you know, I find that setting boundaries in that way has, has really made for like a drastic change in, in my mental health. So I definitely relate to you on that for sure. It's annoying. Like I was narrating audiobooks, but I just like, I didn't really, you know, just kind of did my own thing. And I remember calling a friend of mine to speak to her one day to see how she was doing. And she answered the phone on FaceTime. She was in her patio, which was enclosed wearing a mask. So I asked her, I said, who's in the house with you? Oh, it's just me, you know, my boyfriend. So why do you have a mask on? So it just, this whole thing, I just couldn't deal with her. But it was her birthday and she decided to have a bunch of people over. After the birthday and all the gifts are there, she was distancing herself from people after. So you tell me like what that's about. It's just... I'm just over it and everything. And, um, you know, like I said, I just, I I like to think for myself based upon what I gather from everywhere, not just one thing or two things, just everything. And during the pandemic, what people don't know is I was helping out someone who had a drip IV therapy company. So I learned a lot about science. And one of the people that owned the company is one of the most uh, famous world renowned stem cell cancer research doctors who's affiliated with four different places and uh like everything he said made sense so yeah their um their thing was off and running so you ask me anything about drip IV therapy I could probably answer it <laughs> so I did that for oh. and so that- it, yeah I don't administer it because I'm afraid yeah. of needles but I've had some drip IV therapy before yeah um, so let's talk about your podcast, yes. the crazy train, right? Yes. Yeah. Tell us, uh, what, what gave you the idea to do that and what kind of topics do you cover? Well, I wanted to do it for a while. Um, then there were some issues and then finally it came to light. My co-host Greg, like we came up with the whole thing. Originally it was just a weird kind of fame, which would be a spinoff of the one woman show, but it just made more sense in the direction it was going with the interviews to make it into something where it's, it's, uh, it's mostly him and I talking, uh, with a lot of the, like the whole nineties shock culture era and stories from that time. Cause I do have stories out of that era and even beyond then just from my life. But also we have roundtable discussions where I'll bring in a guest. Um, I know that Lainey, like I said, she'll probably tell you I'm obsessed by Mike Lindell this week. It might be someone else next week, but I want him as like my first guest. Um, I just like interesting people, controversial people, uh, things like that. So, Mm. yeah. So it'll be probably out in October. And it'll cover a bunch of different topics. Um, And we don't really talk politics or anything like that. Just interesting topics, interesting stories. Uh, You know, people from that time that I knew and have not known, but just people that may have raised maybe an eyebrow bit of controversy um, and who they are as people, what they've done, you know, for them, maybe after them, who they are as people, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, I'll give them the crazy stories as well. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's weird when I describe it, it's better when you have the teaser going because the teaser describes it better than how I do. But it will be fun. Do you guys have a a website? Do you have a website for it yet where people can go check the teaser out? No, right now it's just my website, which is a weird kind of fame.com. So whatever stories Mm -hmm. did not make it to the show would definitely be on the, um, the web, the podcast with my co-host and I, like he just sort of yanks them out of me somehow or another. And it's a lot of unknown Jasmine trivia in there. A lot of stuff. Fantastic. So that leads us to the next topic, which is your one woman show. So tell us what's that about? how did you come up with the idea? All of that. Um, Okay, so uh, I suffer from stage fright, and 
while I was at UCB in LA, Upright Citizens Brigade, I had a friend I was in class with who was a wrestler and he had an improv show at Second City. He had me as a guest host for it one night. And someone after the show said, yeah, you should do a one woman show. I'm like, what the hell is that? So I watched a few of them. The only show that really spoke to me that I can understand was Mike Tyson's show, Undefeated. Like I liked that it. it was really simple. He had a great format. He had a great story and he didn't have like all these, like, um, how do you put it? So many bobbles and things on stage. Like it was really perfect and to the point. Uh, I watched Carrie Fisher's. I watched a bunch. I like, I watched a few, but he had something to say, you know, and it was interesting. Then when I met up with Lainey to go on the SDR show, I told her about the idea. And she's like, yeah, that's really cool. I had no idea she knew um, anything about those. Then she was telling me, because I guess she grew up watching those things and was fascinated by it. Uh, So throughout the time, I've not watched other people's shows. I don't want to. I don't feel it's important to, uh, because then it just crams in on your own stuff. Uh, My show has a lot of audio visuals from the 90s. It just seems like it's a perfect time for it. Um, it goes in from humble beginnings to where I am now. So it's called a weird kind of fame because I've been alive in these subcultures for 27 years, 27. Yeah. Shit. That's like a long time. And it just takes you through the whole journey of it. Of course it reenacts the whole one thing I'm famous for. Um, and there's a lot of mm-hmm. audio visuals and fun stuff from it. It's hard to explain. And it, so, where where can people go see it? Uh, the Cutting Room, New York City at 9.30 p.m. And we'll have more dates up there uh, on a weirdkindoffame.com. Uh, and what else is there? Then uh, what else? See, I just think it's like the perfect time as well because I think cancel culture is getting at an all-time high. And it's weird because at the same time, while you have this whole cancel culture, the same people that are out there canceling are the same people that are seduced by this whole era of things they think are so highly inappropriate. I mean, if you were to try doing one of those today, something like that, all the shock and awe and the disgust, it'd be kind of funny, actually. Not that I would do it again, but I wouldn't. Yeah, I I think those, like, huge um, numbered guy gangbangs, I I I don't think one's anyone's done one for a really long time. Not a cool one. Right? No, not like a cool one. Not a cool one. And um, not where there was like so much publicity. I feel as though there has to have that whole element of sleeves and grime and a mm-hmm. circus. Yeah. Everyone likes it. Yeah. It's a circus sounds like a great way to describe it. Well, Jasmine, thank you so much for joining us. This has been um, a real pleasure, and um, I'm glad that we got to meet again virtually. Thank you. And um, besides a weird kind of fame.com, where can people find you? Do you, are you on social media at all? Yeah. So uh, Jasmine does not have an E. Claire has an E. So twitter.com forward slash Jasmine St. Clair. Um, Instagram.com forward slash the real Jasmine St. Clair and Facebook.com forward slash, of course, the, uh, just Jasmine St. Clair. I have a fan page on there because the other one is a capacity with like 5,000 people. It's so ridiculous when they do that. I don't know why they do that. Just shut down Facebook. No, uh, don't. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I have all those. And uh, yeah, then just Crazy Train Podcast, you know, look out for it. And like I said, it's the Jasmine Crazy Train. It wakes up and who knows where it goes and ends up. And the show, Aware Kind of Fame, will be in LA at some point in November at El Cid. So just stay tuned on the website and everything is up there. Fantastic. And I imagine you'll probably announce all of this on your social media as well. So if people follow you, they'll get all that information too. Of course, yeah. And there'll be lots of goodies okay, and treats. Fantastic. And for those of you who um, are you know, curious to see what it was like being alive in that era and like living through the whole you know, all the shock and awe and all that stuff and all the fun things just come on out. It's just, it's, it's a really fun time and a fun storytelling hour of the whole 
everything from start to finish. And lots of like fun audio clips of things and visual clips. Cool. And then do you, do you meet the fans afterwards? Are they able to come up and say hello to you in person? I don't want to. No. Yeah, they are. <laughs> okay. I'm sure that there's going to be a few that would just like love the opportunity to actually meet you in person because you are a legend. They have to be nice though. One would hope so. <laughs> You'd be surprised. I mean, so many people. Oh, and the dress that I do wear on the stage, the actual red dress is actually from um, that whole era. It just, it's like a little bit looser now. It's like fit me skin tight back then, but I've lost so much weight since then. So, which is mm. a good thing. Fantastic. Well, again, Jasmine, thank you so much for your time. And you guys can follow me at Holly Randall um, on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, if you want to check out my Not Safe for Work website where I post all the content that I shoot and direct, go to hollyrandall.com. If you want to support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next week. <laughs>